Um, just a housekeeping note. I know it's after lunch. We're all comatose. So we'll have a short, very short intermission in the middle. Just so you, you know that you can have a little break to stand up and stretch just for a few seconds. I'm honored to be invited to speak today at this wonderful international conference on Maria Valtorta. Thank you so much for allowing me to be here. And thank you, Father Zucchini. Although I have a French-Canadian surname, I am proud to say that I am half Italian. My grandfather was born and raised in Syracuse, and then emigrated to the, to the United, United States in the 1920s, where he was a fisherman in California for 50 years. My mother and relatives still speak the old Sicilian dialect. I am a geologist who has worked mainly in the Western United States. I have previously researched and published on a variety of geologic topics, including chronologies of the ice ages. Because I need to be going down. I was first introduced to the writings of Maria Valtorta in 1989 by my twin brother. I was a Protestant at the time, having abandoned my Catholic upbringing and had recently been married in a Presbyterian church. My brother had learned of Valtorta's writings, and he gave me a copy of volume one of the English version of the poem of the man god and Jean Alagnier's book, The Diary of Jesus. I was struck by reading the clear and descriptive prose of Valtorta's writings. Even today, I still vividly recall the strong spiritual pull on my heart when I began reading the first chapter, Jochum and Anne make a vow to the Lord. It immediately grabbed my attention and put me in a heavenly peaceful place. I couldn't stop reading and continued each day devouring the book, following along with the summary and chronology in the diary of Jesus. Then I read the other four volumes of the poem. Reading Valtorta changed my life. Her writings were instrumental for me to recognize God's desire for the world and transformed me to truly know Jesus and his mother for the first time. It also showed me clearly that God still interacts closely with his people and comes to touch us lovingly through Jesus' church and through revelation. I had lost that sense of the beauty and truth of his church through my previous years away. Valtorta's writings showed me the way back to the true Catholic faith. During this talk, I will first explain the history of my introduction and involvement in Maria Valtorta's writings and then present some of the major conclusions from my research, as well as the problems encountered. Reading the works of Valtorta has led me down not just a spiritual path, but also an intellectual path to evaluate a variety of related topics in other pertinent fields. Also, for the first time in my life, the Gospels came alive to me. During the past 25 years, I have conducted research on Valtorta's writings by focusing on the following tasks. A detailed textual comparison and harmony between the Gospels and the poem. Development of a chronology for all episodes of the poem. Evaluation of the historical context and time frame of this new Valtortan chronology and evaluation of wide-ranging aspects of the Nativity of Jesus. Stepping back to 1981, I started creating a gospel harmony of the episodes in the poem, using the chronology from Jean Alanier's book. On the screen is a portion of this harmony where I compared in detail the text of the Gospels to the text of Valtorta using both English and the Italian version of Poema del Uomo Dio. I compared them verse by verse and word by word to develop this harmony 
and the commentary shown on the right. As I read through the poem, I noticed many inconsistencies between her descriptions and the dating applied in the Diary of Jesus. So I decided to address this problem. I created tables with calculated lunar phases and used them as I reread the poem to generate revised dates for each episode, relying where necessary on the Italian text. In this first redating process, I use mostly the same years for the life of Christ as assigned by Alagne. I also use the proleptic Gregorian calendar, which means the Gregorian calendar projected back in time, instead of the Julian calendar for a number of reasons. At this time, my brother was in contact with Professor Leo Brodeur at the Maria Valtorta Research Center in Quebec, Canada. The group had published the first English version of the Diary of Jesus. So in 1993, I forwarded my new chronology for volume one of the poem to Dr. Brodeur and pointed out inconsistencies in the dating sequence for the Diary of Jesus. The problem was that Alanier had adhered to rules for the Jewish calendar based on calendrical practices that were established a few centuries after Christ. This is the common practice of most researchers because that is all that's available for Jewish writings from the early centuries AD. Alanier also had accepted one of the standard annual time frames based on modern research with the life of Christ extending from 5 BC to 30 AD. Although Valtorta knew virtually nothing about the Jewish calendar and never mentioned any historical numeric years, information within her own writings yielded a different chronology than that presented in the Diary of Jesus. My new chronology was based on a strict reading of Valtorta's writings without the assumptions taken from the literature. Leo Brodeur forwarded my work to his associate, Paul Atworth, who was the editor of the English version of the Diary of Jesus. Atworth was actually the pen name for Brodeur's son, Paul, who had made a large number of revisions for this English edition. Fortunately, my work arrived on the desk of Paul Brodeur soon after he began to collaborate with Dr. Lonnie Van Zant, a professor of physics in the United States. Dr. Van Zant had recently made a fascinating astronomical observation regarding, regarding the dating of Jesus' life after he had read through the poem. In the scene entitled The Night at Gadara, chapter 356, Jesus and the Apostle John were pondering the night sky in March, about 13 months before the crucifixion. Valtorta noted the presence of three planets in the sky, Venus, Mars, and Jupiter. Van Zandt believed that this description of the heavens might be usable to verify the actual years that Jesus dwelt on the earth. <coughs> Dr. Van Zandt determined that of all possible years during Jesus' ministry, these three planets could only be present in the night sky during 31 or 33 AD. <coughs> he later ruled out 31 AD based on lunar conditions leaving 33 AD as the correct year. So, according to Van Zandt's calculation, Jesus was crucified in April of 34 AD and was born in December of 1 BC. These dates were very different from the standard time frame for Jesus' life that is presented in most modern literature. Although quite exciting, this created a number of issues with trying to explain these dates in the historical context of Palestine and the Roman Empire. Because it is well known that King Herod died in 4 BC, this would be a difficult challenge to prove that a chronology based on Valtorta's writings was historically accurate. Alanier was not receptive to the new dating 
in part because this would place Jesus' nativity after the common date for Herod's death. Dr. Van Zant and Paul Brodeur believed the new dates without reservation. Yet, as a skeptical scientist and a doubting Thomas, I carried uncertainties and wondered if these new dates could be real. Could this radical chronology be historically accurate? Or instead, did Maria Valtorta write only figuratively about the vision of Gadara and elsewhere? And how could these dates possibly fit into the historical framework of modern scholarship? As a result of the providential timing of the arrival of my chronology, Paul Brodeur knew that I should be the one to redate the Diary of Jesus. I accepted the challenge. So for the next few years, I worked on this new chronology. I also researched the chronological foundations for dating of events in the Roman Empire and interacted with Brodeur and Van Zant about my findings and problems that arose. These were fascinating times, as we were phoning and sending letters before email with new discoveries and understanding. Unfortunately, these exciting early days of discovery were abruptly cut short. Dr. Van Zant learned he had brain cancer in April 1995. And in July, he passed away at the age of 57. Stepping back to 1993, my first task in redating the life of Christ based on Valtorta's visions was to find me a means to confirm Van Zandt's new astronomical data. Dates, sorry. I was not going to dive into a voluntary project requiring years of my life and little sleep without first convincing myself that I was following the correct path. So I performed a more comprehensive evaluation of the writings of Valtorta using astronomical and chronological indicators to confirm the possible calendar years of Jesus' life. I identified a total of 17 episodes or cases in the poem that contained specific combinations of useful chronological information. In particular, I, I examined texts that mentioned days of the week, Jewish or Julian month dates, Jewish feast dates, and lunar phases. In certain episodes, these chronological elements <clears throat> could only have occurred during a limited number of actual calendar years. For example, suppose Valtorta describes the evening of a Sabbath as the moon was rising during October. The combination, uh, combination of chronological information could be used to limit the number of years when this situation could have taken place during all the possible years of Jesus' life, which is shown on the screen. To be inclusive, this comprises 11 potential sets of years, with the crucifixion year ranging from 26 to 36 AD. <clears throat> because we know Jesus lived to the age of 33 plus, the corresponding sets of years for Jesus' birth would be from 9 BC to 2 AD. Each row in this table represents a different set of historical years for the life of Jesus. By evaluating the calendar date, the calculated dates and times of lunar phases, and the Roman calendar days for each of these years, then it could be determined which years appropriately match the conditions described by Valtorta. Because there are varying degrees of agreement between the episode descriptions and the lunar dates, I gave a score to each case ranging from zero to three for each of the possible sets of years. A score of three meant it was a very good match for that year, and zero was, was essentially impossible. Out of the 11 sets of years, each case typically yielded a few sets of acceptable years, those with the scores of two or three. But obviously, I wanted to limit this down to a single year. If the poem of the man-god can be considered as chronologically accurate, by looking at all of these 17 cases and tallying the scores, 
We would hope to see the descriptions narrow the selection down to a single row of years. In this example of just four of the 17 cases labeled A to D, A, B, C, D, they represent different Jewish calendar months from each of the three plus years of Jesus' ministry. I will not discuss the details of these 17 cases, but take a look at the scores, which range widely. Realistically, scores of two or three would be considered viable, and zero or one would be improbable. Now let's look at the totals for all these 17 cases for these years. Shown here in Italian and English, for the two years of the Gadara night sky from Van Zandt's work, the two crucifixion years of 32 AD and 34 AD are shown on the left. From the calendar evaluation, the total scores per year range from 4 to 49 points on the right. The high score is for the year 34 AD, corresponding to a nativity year of 1 BC. This is the only set of years without any individual low scores of 0 or 1. The alternate crucifixion year from Van Zandt in 32 AD scored a very low 11 total points. The year chosen by Alanier, 30 AD, also was very low at 21 points. The chronological elements in Valtorta's writings do not fit those sets of years. So the time range for Jesus' life between December of 1 BC and April of 34 AD is the only set of calendar years that will fully agree with her descriptions. So in conclusion, Maria Valtorta's writings do indeed appear to withstand astronomical and chronological scrutiny. Is there a question? <clears throat> From this evaluation, a chronology of the life of Christ has been developed based on astronomical and calendrical information. This table shows that the key events during the Messianic cycle you can see that up on the top, Mary was born in October of 18 BC. Jesus was born in late December of 1 BC. He was baptized by John the Baptist in January of 31 AD. Continuing down. He died in April of 34 AD. And on the bottom, Mary was assumed into heaven in July of 55 AD. Because much of my research deals with the birth of Christ, I will briefly describe the derivation of the nativity date. Using this chronology, the crucifixion is easily determined to be Friday the 21st of April, 34 AD in the Gregorian calendar. This is equivalent to 23 AD in the Julian calendar, just two days uh, different. From Valtorta's writings, we know that Jesus was born on the Jewish calendar date of Kislev 25, apparently under a full or nearly full moon, in, in the depth of a cold December night. In the book of Azariah, Valtorta's angel seems to state that the life of Jesus extended for 1737 years. Weeks, sorry. <laughs> However, the wording in this text implies that this number of weeks excludes the final week of Jesus' life, his holy week. The text states, nor does any of all the 1737 weeks which saw him in the world equal this final one as a man subject to pain. So in other words, Jesus lived a total of 1737 plus one, or 1738 weeks which is equivalent to an exact 412 lunar cycles. Therefore, since we know Jesus died around the time of a full moon, this reveals that she, he should have been born around the full moon. If we subtract a full 1738 weeks from the 21st of April, 34 AD, the crucifixion date, this brings us to the 29th of December, 1 BC in the Gregorian calendar. Because we don't know if the 1738 weeks is an exact amount or rounded off to the nearest whole week, 
This would indicate a birth date within plus or minus three days of the 29th of December. By combining Valtorta's descriptions of the Nativity Night with my chronological and astronomical findings, I concluded that Jesus was born under the full moon, very close to midnight, when the moon was at zenith or transit position. The date of the full moon in December of 1 BC is on the night of 27 to 28 December. Gregorian. Sorry. <laughs> There are also certain astronomical signs in this holy night of Christ's birth. The day of the week for this first Christmas is Thursday, the 28th of December. So the final conclusion is that Jesus lived to be a total of 1,738 weeks and one day. This chronology indicates that Jesus' life lasted about 400 Roman months for a total of 33 years, three months, three weeks, and three days. Jesus' public ministry lasted exactly 1,200 days, beginning with his baptism. Developing information on the nativity of Christ and trying to place the new chronology into the historical framework have been very time consuming. I have developed a manuscript Uh, for, for a book on the nativity, which is about 80% complete. With this book, I hope to reach outside of Catholic circles and allow Maria Valtorta's writings to reach a wider audience. This research has been done by combining information in her writings with that from a large number of other sources. These sources include scripture, writings of early church fathers and church calendars, writings of ancient Latin and Greek authors, astronomical information, astrological writings in the craft of the Magi, ancient inscriptions, and the works of modern researchers on a number of topics. I will touch on some of the historical findings and complications of this work later. Before I continue any further, let me point out that I have not yet directly published any of my work. Some difficulty, difficulties and challenges in life have prevented that from happening. Fortunately, Stephen Austin for the last two years has been kindly urging me to complete some aspects and to publish these results. It will get completed hopefully in the not too distant future. In 1998, I started working with David Webster of the United States. David, like me, had developed a harmony of the Gospels using the poem as a guide. David enthusiastically wanted to add a chronology to his harmony, so we started working together as co-authors on a chronological harmony, along with other research. I provided my chronology and harmony to him and copies of my manuscripts on the Nativity and the Assumption and other information. We then melded that information and continued working together for a few years. But in 2002, it became evident that we had quite divergent views of how to proceed. And so unfortunately, I removed myself from this co-author arrangement. He proceeded without me um, and eventually published his chronological harmony and guide to the poem. He made some slight modifications to my chronology, but otherwise the dates he used in his publication are those developed by me. So although I have not yet published my own research on Valtorta's writings, my essential chronology and some other work are available in Webster's publication, where he has acknowledged my input. Since then, I have continued to improve the accuracy and detail of the chronology. The situation leading to the chronology described earlier is not as simple or clean as it appears. I would like to point out some apparent problems or discrepancies in developing a chronology using calendrical and astronomical information in the poem. I don't do this to criticize Veltorta's writings, but as a researcher, I try to be impartial and present not only the congruent parts of the work, but also the seemingly discordant parts hopefully as a catalyst for discussion. 
I remain a strong believer in the divinely inspired nature of her writings. A small fraction of episodes in the poem show uncertainty in assigning calendar dates, due primarily to variances between the sequence of events and the astronomy of the vision. Part of the problem may be my own inability to properly understand the meaning or application of the words. For example, in some sets of episodes, times around full moon seem to occur more frequently than monthly. Dates can be assigned in these cases, but uncertainties remain in the chronology of lunar phases. One example of a challenging set of episodes is in Jesus' second year of ministry in July of 32 AD, while at and near Sycaminon with his disciples. In a few scenes, the description of the lunar phases, the timing of the sea tides, and the chronology for sequencing of events are in disagreement with each other. Full moon or near full moon days are seen to occur too frequently, and lunar phases seem out of order. Prioritization is necessary in using or ignoring some chronological elements in these descriptions in order to provide appropriate dates to this sequence of events. But certainly, for a large majority of Valtorta's writings, these problems are not present, and we are able to produce a reliable chronology with concordant astronomical features. Note that the only possible date for the vision of the night at Gadara is 13 to 14 March of 33 AD, based on the chronological sequencing, day of the week, and time of moonrise. This is the same date that Liberato de Caro mentioned yesterday. Valtorta describes a dark, quiet night after everyone in town was asleep, just like we are now, I can see, we're all asleep, with the presence of Venus, Mars, and Jupiter. <laughs> Thank you. The presence of Venus, Mars, and Jupiter in the sky. However, according to planetarium software programs, which are very reliable, Venus would have set at the horizon only 30 minutes after sunset, during twilight when the sky would not be dark and the town would not be silent. Perhaps instead of Venus, she actually saw Saturn, which is higher in the sky, but she never mentioned that. And it was even brighter than Mars that night. There are other concerns with the locations of the moon and constellations. The night sky that she described is more appropriate for a month earlier. Dr. Van Zant and I pondered and struggled over this issue without resolution. But regardless of these discrepancies, the sequencing of events yields a chronology that is constrained to a Sunday night in mid-March, three weeks before Passover, and there are no other options for dating this episode. So in this case, the chronology is soundly developed, but the astronomy of the vision does not ideally fit the night sky for this date. And as promised, we can stand up for 15 seconds if you want to, just to stretch. <laughs> Time's up. Although the Roman calendar dates can be worked out with some accuracy using available information in the poem, the Jewish calendar dates are more difficult. No. <laughs> Let me briefly present a listing of the Jewish calendar months and major feasts. The months in red are those I will be discussing. This calendar has been used, this Jewish calendar has been used as such for many centuries. The lunar months are 29 to 30 days in length. Because the Jewish calendar was and still is a lunar solar calendar, an extra lunar month has to be intercalated every two to three years to keep alignment with the solar year. This happens during what is called an embolismic or bisextal year. This intercalation now and in the past takes place via insertion 
of a second month of Adar at the end of the year, so after month 12, around March. This is just before the first month of Nisan, which is the month when Passover takes place, number one. It is generally assumed that this same pattern of intercalation before Passover has been in place since the time of Christ. But in fact, the details of this method are only known from documents written a few centuries after Christ. Valtorta's writings reveal some surprising differences in the Jewish calendar compared to what you will find in the literature. Had Valtorta attempted to create a history and chronology of this time period, she would never have placed these odd exceptions into the calendar. I will discuss some examples of these differences compared to the standard Jewish calendar of later centuries. Late in the first year of Jesus' public ministry in November of 31 AD, Rabbi Gamaliel smoke, spoke about the calendar for the year that Jesus was found in the temple at age 12 in 13 AD, and for the current year of ministry in 31 AD. It is known from the ancient literature that Gamaliel was a member of the Sanhedrin and that he handled rules dealing with calendar intercalation. In excellent agreement with this knowledge in the poem, chapter 114, Gamaliel stated, there was a, bright, a great brightness of a divine sunshine on that cold day in a bitter winter. It was Passover. Men were worried about the frozen crops. You may all remember the harvest of that embolismic year, a year of 13 months, as it happens also this year. I really enjoy this statement by Gamaliel, and it makes me think that Jesus was giving a wonderful little gift to Catholic chronologists. In fact, this and other statements in Valtorta's writings make me think that Jesus actually desires the chronology of his life to be understood and developed. If nothing else, these chronological and historical details support the veracity of her writings. This discussion by Gamaliel brings out some chronologically very useful information. First, it helps us to determine the calendar months for these years and for the adjacent years. Next, it shows the intercalation of a lunar month did not happen just before Passover, as would be expected, between the months of Adar and Nisan. Otherwise, it would not have been so cold at Passover. Also, through evaluation of the calendars and lunar phases, it shows that Passover could actually be occur before or on the vernal equinox and not always after. Gamaliel was very clear that this Passover was quite cold and therefore must have taken place in March and probably no later than mid-March. So the intercalated lunar month during 13 AD was sometime after Nisan in order to get the subsequent months and feasts in line with the weather and agriculture. The specific sequencing and dating of episodes in the poem reveal that in the embolismic year 31 AD, the intercalation of a lunar month took place in April to May. In 33 AD, it took place in June to July. Based on this chronology from Valtorta's writings, the question arises as to why almost all modern scholars ignore 34 AD as a likely crucifixion year. One main reason is that the crucifixion day for that year, Nisan 14, could only occur on a Friday if it fell in April, not March. This April date would have occurred if a Jewish embolismic year preceded the year of the crucifixion. The poem shows that this indeed happened. 33 AD was embolismic. As a result, the subsequent Passover was quite late and Nisan 14 was in late April of 34 AD. Note that due to the preceding embolismic year, the Redeemer suffered to a far greater extent during his passion. Palestine is significantly hotter in April than in March, and the poem reveals the additional torment that this heat inflicted upon Jesus during his final hours. In addition, the poem reveals that some unusual calendar events took place during Jewish embolismic years. This includes the following examples. Feast day schedules were significantly altered during embolismic years. 
This is how Jesus could be born on Kislev 25 under a full moon, when a normal Kislev 25 should be a waning crescent moon. The Feast of Lights or dedication during embolismic years did not always occur during the typical lunar month dates of Kislev 25 to Tivet 2, and it could be longer than the usual eight days also. The day of Passover during embolismic years could occur before the vernal equinox, as in 13 AD, and could occur before the full moon of Nisan, as in 31 AD. Pentecost was not always 50 days after Passover during embolismic years. In 31 AD, there were about 80 days between the feasts due to intercalation of a month. In 33 AD, there were 59 days which is exactly two lunar months apart, with both feasts falling on a full moon. In 31 AD, it appears that a second tabernacle's feast took place, possibly due to the late harvest or vintage. In addition, even during regular years, Passover appears always to have fallen on a Friday or Saturday. It is not known if this is coincidental or is intentional to make it easier to avoid travel on the Sabbath for distant pilgrims. The Jewish calendar months could also have shorter or longer durations than the standard 29 to 30 days. In 32 AD, the month of Adar was 32 days long, perhaps to align the upcoming Passover on a Friday. In 33 AD, Adar was only 27 days long. In evaluating the historical framework for the life of Jesus, based on Valtorta's writings, my focus has been on the birth of Jesus and other events from the infancy narratives. The main documents that are involved for the history of pertinent events in this part of the empire including, include the writings of the Jewish historian Flavius Josephus, the New Testament, early church fathers and church calendars, and the writings of a few other Greek and Latin authors. The conclusions of this research show that the chronology developed from Valtorta's writings and the Gospels generally agrees within a year or two of the writings of early church fathers and some non-Christian his historical writings. However, the major questions with the timing and events surrounding the Nativity derive from the writings of Josephus. Fortunately, Valtorta helps illuminate some specific aspects of Josephus' writings that have long confused researchers by scrambling the history of the time around the birth of Christ. This helps to unravel the mystery of the Nativity and the census of Quirinius mentioned in Luke's Gospel and in the poem. For example, both Luke and Valtorta show that there was only a single census in Palestine during the entire life of Christ, and this was during the Nativity. My studies on the historical framework of the Nativity reveal complexities for this time period. For example, depending on the source of the ancient writings, we are dealing with three different chronological benchmarks for the time near the birth of Christ. Number one, according to the astronomical chronology generated using the poem, Jesus was born in December of 1 BC. Number two, According to many early Christian writings and using other writings of the Roman Empire, the birth of Jesus would be placed in the year we know as 2 BC, in an unprecedented year of peace during the Pax Augusta. So the 1 BC of Valtorta is the same year as this Roman 2 BC, but listed with a one year difference. And I'll discuss this more in a minute. Number three, for Palestine and Syria, according to the writings of Josephus and the modern reckoning of his chronology, the birth of Jesus would be placed in approximately 8 BC, a few years before the death of King Herod. Again, the 1 BC of Valtorta is the same as Josephus' 8 BC, but the chronology has been scrambled and is, list and is listed with a seven-year difference. This discrepancy of chronologies have confused researchers for centuries 
and prompted hundreds of scholarly articles trying to decipher the date of Jesus' birth and resolve the census quandary. Determining how these three benchmark timescales correlate to each other is no doubt challenging. But again, Valtorta's writings do help to direct our attention to identify the flaws. In order to further warp your chronological sensibilities, here is one final example of the complexity of these benchmarks for three different parts of Jesus' life. Note that the chronology for the non-Josephus writers of the Roman Empire, that was the number two in the last slide, is one year earlier than the Veltorten astronomical chronology, together with the Gospel of Luke. This one year dis difference is shown, is shown here for two cases early in the life of Jesus, but for a later case, the difference be becomes two years. So as stated above, there's a one year difference for the peaceful year of the nativity in 1 BC instead of 2 BC. There is a one-year difference for the time when Augustus died and Tiberius began his reign in 15 AD, according to Valtorta, instead of the usual 14 AD. In chapter 459 of the poem, dated September of 33 AD, Valtorta wrote of Tiberius and his assistant Sejanus, who had amassed great power. However, according to the common chronology for the Roman Empire, Sejanus died in October of 31 AD at the height of his power. So this difference is in the same direction, but for two years, not one. Without going into any further details, we can see that there are many issues that come into play in the historical time frame for this chronology. The research will continue in order to explain and defend the Valtorten chronology. I will finish with a brief note on the gospel harmony. The poem serves as a beautiful illumination tool for understanding scripture. The research on this harmony, involving a detailed textual evaluation between Valtorta's descriptions and the gospel texts, shows that an intricate relationship exists between the two. It is complex enough in some episodes that no one could suggest that Valtorta created her text by reading and modifying the gospels. In creating my harmony, under the assumption that Valtorta's writings are historically accurate, it becomes apparent that the evangelists occasionally borrowed or applied some texts from one episode and substituted into it into other episodes that have similar wording or meaning. In essence, certain gospel verses belong in two different places in the harmony. In addition, the use of textual metaphor and substituted <coughs> wording is fairly common. This reapplication of text is shown here with red symbols and, the, and with the commentary and the harmony. For me, completing the detailed word-for-word -word harmonization of the Gospels based on the poem has been very enlightening in learning scripture. Although I have delved into many different technical aspects related to Maria Valtorta's writings, the topic that has touched me the most from reading and investigating this information is learning about the person of Jesus and seeing his absolute perfection in every aspect of his life, especially in his teachings and in all the interactions with the people around him. He is perfect. Whether or not the technical aspects in the writings of Valtorta stand up to scientific or historical scrutiny, the perfect actions and words of our Lord resound with the divine nature in her writings. Thank you. Mi prendo, no, no, tenete sulla, sulla cuffia, tenete sulla cuffia. Mi prendo un diritto di prelazione, abbiate pazienza, visto che ci siamo. Grazie per tutti i dati, professor Dubé. Però alcune domande mi vengono, magari non riesce a rispondere, per cui sono domande di, di buon senso, niente di più. Ah, a proposito, la traduttrice continua, continua a parlare di Josef, è Giuseppe. In Italia si chiama Giuseppe Flavio, chiaro? Scusate, ecco, mi raccomando. Eh. 
dato italiano, vabbè. No, se no andate a cercare Tor Giuseppe non lo trovate. Certo, le guerre giudaiche sono di Giuseppe e Flavio, in buon italiano. Perché Maria Valtorta, cosa risponderebbe alla domanda, perché Maria Valtorta non si è mai posto il problema cronologico? Ce lo poniamo noi, perché lei no? Per caso dava scontato quello che sapeva volgarmente, eh, semplicemente, eh, da quello che raccontavano i sacerdoti negli anni 40 e 50? Ipotesi, eh? Eh. Good question. Um, I don't, well, I don't know what Maria Valtorta knew about history. Um, I, I understood she was somewhat ignorant um, about chronology and history, the Jewish calendar, and I, I have no idea if she ever read Josephus or was instructed by, by priests or spiritual directors. Um, so I don't, I don't know if I have an answer to that other than I, I get the impression she's just recording what she sees and hears and it's, it's up to us after the fact to try to put it together and figure out how it relates to the writings of Josephus. Sì, sono d'accordo anch'io, ma allora la conclusione dovrebbe essere questa. Non è Maria Valtorta, non è indagare Maria Valtorta a questo punto, eh? non è indagare Maria Valtorta se ha scritto bene, ma dare per scontato, cioè dare per scontato che Maria Valtorta ha scritto bene e sono gli altri che si devono adeguare. Perché? Altra domanda conseguente. Benedetto XVI, nel suo primo volume sul, sul Gesù di Nazareth, dice nessuno è, eh, nessuno, no, non è il termine, il termine certezza non è giusto, nessuno è, eh, non è toccato dai propri pregiudizi, chiunque lo è, tutti, quindi è inutile discutere. Allora dice, allora facciamo questo discorso. Immaginiamo che quello che ci dicono i Vangeli sia giusto e andiamo a vedere se quello che dicono i Vangeli è più vero di quello che dicono il numero di critici su Gesù. Allora, prendiamo questo principio. Immaginiamo che Maria Valtorta abbia ragione e gli altri eh, abbiano torto. Se dunque io prendo Maria Valtorta, e la domanda la faccio a lei ma anche al professor De Caro, eh, visto che c'è qui, ecco, eh, se Maria Valtorta ha ragione, allora, ho io la possibilità di eh, risolvere più problemi che non quello che dicono gli esegeti, visto che, primo, gli esegeti non sono concordi, cioè ciascuno racconta la sua e si passa da Gesù mai vissuto a Gesù che, boh, si racconta le cose più strane, ehm, da un Gesù extraterrestre, tanto per dire. E non solo, ma... Eh, se io mi astengo da confrontarli con dei dati storici, gli ultimi che lei ha citato, um, degli imperatori, eccetera, siamo certi di dover tener conto di questo? E ancora un'altra cosa. In tutti i dati che noi abbiamo a livello uh, di, di tipo giudaico, abbiamo tenuto conto del dramma 70-132 d.C., in cui... Tutto Israele è spazzato via, restano solo, i, uh, i, uh, restano solo i farisei che rifanno tutto, storia compresa, rifanno tutta la storia, compresi i libri, i libri rivelati o meno per Israele. Cioè, ne, ne teniamo conto di questo. Domanda, eh, guardi che è solo una domanda. Eh. Cioè, capisco il dramma, ma noi non ci rendiamo conto cos'è toccato quando Gerusalemme è diventata Elia Capitolina, i romani mica scherzavano, eh? arrivavano lì, spianavano tutto, ci spargevano il sale, tanto per essere sicuri, e dopodiché si discuteva. Mi scusi. Quindi i romani hanno veramente disperso Israele. Sì, ma anche Israele, cioè i farisei, mica hanno scherzato. Nella, ne, nel loro sinodo di Yamnia, nel concilio di Yamnia, che è del fine 70, e hanno rifatto la storia. Scusate, se noi leggiamo la storia dell'Antico Testamento alla luce degli, dei, dei, dei farisei, 
del dopo 70 o dopo 132, guardate che si è spostato il centro, eh? prima era il Tempio, poi diventa la Torah. Noi oggi diamo per scontato che sia la Torah, beh, beh, figurati, è questo. No, calma, questo è per noi. Questo è per Israele dopo cento, il 70. Prima era il Tempio. Non che la Torah non avesse valore, ma non il valore che è andato dopo. Perché? Perché dopo c'era il grosso problema di come tenere in piedi Israele. Non c'è più il Tempio, non c'è più, c'è più nulla, siamo dispersi. Che cosa tiene unito un popolo? La Torah. Ma allora noi quando rifacciamo i calcoli, teniamo, avete, avete tenuto conto di questo? Punto interrogativo. Perché è una cosa che, di cui tener conto, è un'altra cosa. Perché non poter pensare che in quel pezzo di cielo che vedeva Maria Valtorti in quegli anni, qualche volta non abbia preso qualche abbaglio Maria Valtorti, e con questo non mi raccomando, eh, qui, allora, è un pensierino che mi è venuto, magari non è vero, vabbè, lasciatemelo dire, non voglio mica, per favore, eh, non, non mettete in dubbio il, la, la, quello che voglio fare con Maria Valtorti, però è giusto che io mi ponga questo problema. Um, ancora, banale banale, eh? spero che abbiate tenuto conto, tenuto conto eh, perché quando si gira attorno all'anno meno uno, più uno, forse qualche presente eh, ha pensato, e, e dov'è l'anno zero? No, 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 non lo dico ai tecnici, lo dico, lo dico a Don Ernesto e alla povera gente, dice no, meno uno, zero, più uno. Oh! Gente, guardate che l'anno zero non esiste. No, vi racconto sta storiella perché è vera. I testimoni di Geova hanno continuato a contare le date tenendo conto dell'anno zero. Poi sono arrivati a un certo punto, qualcuno gli ha detto, oh, guardate, e loro hanno spostato dal 607 al 606. Dice perché? E dice, non si conta più l'anno zero. Vabbè, questi giochetti li lasciamo a loro, però. Qui bisognerebbe evitarli. Ecco, Comin eh, le avete tenuto conto? Scusate, eh. capisco, sono... Una serie mh, e, e un'altra cosa, semplicemente. Sì, sì, un'altra cosa, perché è importante quello che stiamo dicendo. Eh? Se salta questo, salta... resta una bella favola. C'è l'UNESCO. No, no, d'accordo, d'accordo. Però volevo aggiungere questo, quest'altro pensierino. Uh, io, anche lei, ho visto che in qualche caso ci sono i riferimenti della, 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 eh, del poema dell'uomo Dio. E allora la domanda è, abbiate pazienza, ma a questo punto è un problema grosso. Ieri, scandalizzando qualcuno, ho detto chi ci certifica che quel che sappiamo è giusto. Eh? Primo. Secondo, esiste un'uniformità mondiale in tutte le traduzioni degli stessi numeri per cui il 200, capitolo 262 è il 262, per voi, per noi, per i francesi e per gli spagnoli? No, perché se no non ci ritroviamo più. Vi svelo che una delle prime critiche che io ho fatto al dottor Pisani, critica feroce come mia, quando mi sono trovato di fronte all'Evangelo con quegli esterischi in italiano a mo' di note, e francamente sono diventato un elicottero. Perché? perché così non si cita. Poi tu citi 462,3 e ti trovi davanti a 20 righe. Scusa, eh? E mo' tutte le volte devo cercare una roba del genere. Stringi? Stringi. Invece hanno fatto così. Ora, questo, eh, non so se voi avete verificato questo, perché ad esempio, lei mi dà i suoi studi, ma se io non riesco a sapere dove vado a trovare quei dati nel, nel, nell'Evangelo, eh, devo, devo totalmente fidarmi di lei, cosa che vabbè posso anche farlo, ma faccio, facciamo in modo di riprenderlo. Mi fermo qui, eh. capisco che sono stato piuttosto violento. Posso uh, rispondere a tutte le vostre domande molto rapidamente? La risposta è sì. Yes, <laughs> yes to all of them. <laughs> Eh, io invece vorrei aggiungere giusto un commento per quanto riguarda i vincoli che vengono dalla storia romana 
Effettivamente i vincoli che vengono dalle opere di altri scrittori antichi, come quello di Giuseppe Flavio, sono vincoli di cronologia relativa, perché si fa sempre riferimento a, ad altri regni, di altri re e così via. Prendiamo un esempio, l'esempio di, di, di Erode il Grande, che viene posto la, la morte il 4 a.C., ci sono diversi autori, e quindi non sarebbe compatibile con la nascita di Gesù nell'1 a.C., come viene dall'analisi dell'opera valdortiana, eh, perché c'è perché Matteo che parla del, um, eh, del, dei magi e del, della strage degli innocenti, e quindi il del Grande doveva essere ancora vivo, ci sono alcuni autori che propongono, come era Prasi nel, nell'antico Israele, che eh, Erode il Grande nel 4 a.C. non sia morto, ma in quell'anno sia iniziata la correggenza del regno con i suoi tre figli, eh, perché era una maniera per evitare alla morte del, del re che i figli si uccidessero tra di loro per ereditare tutto il regno. E allora c'è una prova anche numismatica della presenza di questo periodo in cui Erode ha corregnato, una possibile prova, ha corregnato con i suoi figli. Perché? Perché do, 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 dalle monete antiche trovate, dei regni di Filippo, il tetrarca, di Erode Antipa e eh, dell'altro figlio, di, di, di Erode il Grande, non, non, non abbiamo monete che siano, siano state coniate, che portino nel conio, né il primo anno di regno, né il secondo, né il terzo, né il quarto. Le prime sono dal quinto anno in poi. Allora gli storici sono chiesti, ma com'è possibile che di tre regni si sono perse le monete diciamo, del primo anno, del secondo anno, terzo anno, quarto anno? L'altra ipotesi plausibile a questo punto è che per 4 o 5 anni, che per 4 anni c'è stata la correggenza, poi è morto Erode, quando è morto Erode i figli hanno iniziato a coniare monete del proprio conio e hanno indicato il quinto anno di regno perché effettivamente per, dal loro punto di vista erano già 4 anni che regnavano. Quindi... Il 4 a.C. non sarebbe, secondo questa ipotesi, la, la data della morte di Rodi Grande, ma l'inizio della sua correggenza. Se aggiungiamo 4-5 anni a questa data, arriviamo all'1-2 d.C. e quindi diventa nuovamente compatibile con la nascita di Gesù nell'1 a.C. Poi, per quanto riguarda Seiano, l'altro esempio citato, non so se adesso ne parlerà eh, Fernando, pa Fernando parlerà di questo, anche di Seiano, e allora ci spiegherà se lui il problema di Seiano, come dire quindi ci sono questi vincoli di storia romana, però in realtà non sono dei vincoli assoluti cioè eh, la storia è fatta anche di, di queste cose, cioè man mano che si trovano nuove pensiamo ho fatto l'esempio del, diciamo, delle monete antiche, man mano che si trovano nuovi reperti archeologici, nuovi documenti nuove prove e viene sempre rivista, le date anche di storia romana possono essere riviste, quindi potrebbe essere che fra dieci anni eh, Ciò che adesso apparentemente è incompatibile con la cronologia di Maria Valtorto invece diventa assolutamente diciamo, compatibile. Mi ha, sempre, mi ha sempre stupito un mio confratello esegeta, insegna a, a la, al seminario qui in Tredio Cesano, che lui diceva per quanto riguarda le cronologie, guarda qui nessuno sa niente, quindi vai, esegeta, quindi... Dunque ringraziamo il professor Dubè che non vorrei che il professor Dubè non si sentisse messo sotto accusa, non era questa la mia intenzione, eh? era solamente porre delle domande, domande secondo me lecite. Ah, non si sente? Riesce a capire, sentire? Ecco bene. No, nel senso che non voglio, mi raccomando, sto semplicemente gentilmente cercando, mi sono son venuti questi input eh, e quindi lo ringraziamo.